Friend, uh, tonight we have actually have a very timely program given the recent events in, in Kuwait, in Ukraine. Uh, the title of our program is The Myth of the Cold War. Our speaker is librarian Daniel Weinberg, who is going to present the story of the USA post World War II and the creation of the Cold War. So he's asking the question Did the USA and the USSR? allow each other to do what each wanted, from Chechnya to Afghanistan to Iraq to Crimea. So, a warm round of applause for our speaker of the evening, Dan Boyd. A librarian. You want to watch this video first? Yeah. Uh, first, we're going to watch a video from October 1962 of President Kennedy uh, with a missile crisis, which I think was the most uh, closest to war that we ever came with Russia. It was a very serious time. Cold War 
in 19, October 1962. Um, I'm going to go over the story before that. I'm going to talk about uh, different things that happened in America before that that uh, led up to to the cold to that Cuba crisis and uh, also um, up to today with the Ukraine problem. So this this is the Three Stooges um, with their with their terrible bomb, and uh, it's not atomic, but you never know. Okay. So in 1941, Henry Luce gave a speech. He, Henry Luce was the person who started Time Magazine, Time and Life, and Newsweek, and Sports Illustrated, all those great American news magazines. Um, and he, he said basically this was going to be the American century, the uh, time that America would be superior in the world. Uh, there was another Henry, Henry Wallace, who was the vice president for um, Roosevelt from, until 1945. You can take. Um, 1945. And um, Henry Wallace said, this is going to be the century of the common man. The world was full of Ill illiterate people, and this was going to be the century when we ed educate everybody, uh, bring up everybody up to standards that will make them smarter, and there'll be more peace. There'll be industry around the world, and and we'll see what happens, as opposed to Henry Luce's uh, American century, which was more uh, conservative, I think. <laughs> So, Russia, <clears throat> the atomic bomb in uh, 1945 was done by America, of course, in Japan. And um, Russia, this forced Russia to make their own bomb. They, they were uh, competitors with America, even though they worked together in the Second World War. Um, Russia fighting in the east, fighting Germany, and America in the west fighting uh, in France. They eventually got together and fought together. The uh, firebombing of Dresden and Berlin were, I would say, it was unnecessary. Um, 100,000 people were killed in each city by this firebombing and almost more than were killed in Japan from the atomic bomb. And I would say that, that the firebombing in, in Germany was a, a message to Russia that America was on the move and America was going to take over where Britain uh, was not taking over anymore. One thing about um, America at war, Henry Kissinger once said that the USA, the United States, is the only country that has had no foreign invaders. So they had a choice of where they want to be involved. In World War One, they they had a choice. In World War Two, they had a choice until uh, Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. The USSR had great losses in World War II. 20 million Russians died. Uh, one third of Russia was destroyed in World War II. So that's equivalent to Chicago, to the East Coast being wiped out in a war, which is kind of major. So there was a major uh, depression in, so in Soviet Russia at that time. And um, the Marshall Plan, the Americans thought maybe Russia would be in included in the Marshall Plan, but uh, eventually they 
destroyed, they crossed out that idea. And um, uh, just left out Russia from the Marshall Plan. The Churchill speech of um, March 5th, 1946 was in uh, Fulton, Missouri. And in it he said something like, um, from Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. So uh, he said that he actually used that phrase "iron curtain" in other letters to Truman before that. Chicken noodle news. So I think uh, Stalin was trying to expand the Russian uh, hegemony in Europe, and America was trying to not to uh, counteract that. The Marshall Plan in Europe was a, uh, it was also known as the European Recovery Act. There were over 70 million Europeans who were killed during World War II. So there was major devastation in Europe. And so um, 13, million $13 billion was promised to re rebuild Europe. There were 60 different countries. And um, $13 billion, which is equivalent to maybe 10 times that today, $130 billion, which is not a small amount. This was uh, the first major corporate welfare uh, to, to uh, Europe then because a lot of the money would come back to America because uh, European countries would buy different uh, armaments from the American uh, corporations, they would buy um, building materials to build up their cities and make roads, and um, so a lot of the money would be coming back to America that they gave out in the Marshall Plan. This was something similar to TARP which by George Bush. Um, government welfare, you could call it, but um, it was to make Europe and America a stronger country. The, uh, there's a secret uh, document that's right here. It's from 1950, and it was uh, called NSC 68, the United States Objectives and Programs for National Security. It was a report to the president, to uh, Eisenhower, no, Truman, 1950. So in it, they, uh, the government, part of the CIA, devised a plan to what would happen during a war with Russia. What would happen, what would we do, how would we counteract the war with Russia? And um, so there were plans on how to rebuild them, rebuild the country, real, rebuild Europe. For instance, it says, the Kremlin is not able to select whatever means are expedient in seeking to carry out its fundamental design. Thus, it can make the best of several worlds. Two, uh, two enormous organizations, the Communist Party and the secret police, are an outstanding source of strength in the Kremlin. In the party, it has an apparatus designed to impose at home an ideological uniformity among its people and to act abroad as an instrument of propaganda, subversion, and, and espionage. So basically, it's saying that Russia is an evil empire, just like Reagan said. Um, Reagan said that, yes. Mm -hmm. 
says here, the, the Soviet Union is developing the military capacity so, to support its design for world domination. The Soviet Union actually possesses armed forces far in excess of those necessary to defeat, defend its national territory. So they're getting ready to build up the American army, the American nuclear bombs, and um, to counteract Russia. I use I use these two books, uh, Oliver Stone, The Untold History of the United States, and The Cold War, A New History by John Lewis Gaddis. They're both, uh, the Gaddis book is more conservative. He's from Texas. He's a friend of George W. Bush, and um, he's more conservative than Oliver Stone's and Peter Kuznick's. It's more Thank liberal, you, Ron. Chicken noodle, minestrone, chicken, right? So uh, the NSC-68 uh, devised the CIA, and the CIA was begun during 1940, uh, late 1948 to 1950. Mm. It set the, uh, set the ground rules for engagement with Russia, basically. The act that um, established the CIA, and which grew out of the OSS in World War II. In 1948, 62% um, of all federal research was military related. So this eventually made up the um, this came up with computers, the internet, it was all military related. Are you okay, sir? Um, 1948. In the Greece, there was an election in Greece in 1948. Um, after, during World War II, um, the Nazis, Germans, and uh, Italians took over Greece, basically. So there was a power vacuum in, uh, after the war. So uh, the Communist Party in Greece was very strong and popular. And uh, they were going to win the election, that looked like. So the CIA came in and basically worked on the election and dropped leaflets all over the country and talked to people and put on uh, public relations and, public, and radio advertising for against the communists. And eventually the communists, in the, in the election, the communists lost. So this was a great victory for the CIA. Um, some people think that the Cold War started with the Greek um, election of 1948. George F. Kennan wrote a, a long telegram, it was also called the X article, in 1947. It was uh, about, he was a the diplomat to Russia, and he said that the Ru Russians wanted perpetual war with capitalism. And uh, the, the Rus Russians viewed left-wing people in all countries, in America, in Europe, as their friends and people they could work with. And also, the uh, Soviet government did not allow uh, true pictures of, rea of, their, of their inner workings to the outside world. They were very secretive. 
the Truman Doctrine speech of 1947 was a very, very important uh, milestone in the Cold War. We, uh, Truman said that America would provide e uh, military and economic assistance to all democratic societies, all democratic nations, no matter where they were in the world. And so this, this set up the current, uh, current policy in Ukraine, where we're supporting Ukraine. And Truman did it in 1947, so it's been going on for at least 50 years. Truman said that uh, he gave money to Greece and Turkey to support democratic uh, parties there and quite a lot of money and it was successful and now Greece and Turkey are friends of the United States. The, uh, the British government in March of 1947 said that they would no longer provide medical, uh, military and economic assistance to the Greek government in their war against the Greek Communist Party. So America stepped in and took over their uh, took over their their role in the world and basically supported democratic uh, nations. So Truman gave four hundred million dollars worth of aid to both Greece and Turkey in nineteen forty eight. NATO. NATO was signed April 4th, 1949. And it was basically after the Treaty of Russell, Brussels. It was uh, <coughs> built on that treaty, which uh, included Belgium, Netherlands, Luxembourg, France, and, and the UK. The, uh, the treaty and uh, Russia's Berlin blockade led to the creation of the Western Europe Defense Organization, which was before uh, NATO. <coughs> Lord, uh, Lord Is Is Ismay said that the purpose of NATO was to keep the Russians out, the Americans in, and the Germans down. So basically the Germans were, well, they were defeated during World War II, so uh, America wanted to keep them down. But Germany eventually joined NATO in 1954. I think, um, and the, there are 28 current members of NATO, which include Poland, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Romania, Slovakia, and Slovenia, which were all part of the Russian uh, orbit before, the, before this. East Germany. I think it shows that NATO is very uh, popular, very powerful. I mean, people usually go with the winner, and uh, NATO is, seems to be a winner. Of course, of course uh, Ukraine won't, doesn't want to be part of NATO. Well, maybe they did, but the president uh, went back on it, and then Russia invaded. So, talk a little bit about Russia. Um, The Russians uh, had the first uh, Sputnik, had the first rocket that sent the rocket up in space. And that was probably because of German scientists who went to Russia and worked with them together with Russian scientists and um, made it before the Americans made, made a, bomb, a rocket. 
Um, Stalin died in March of 1953. Edward Teller said that um, the U.S. had lost a battle more important and greater than Pearl Harbor when uh, uh, Russia sent up a, a rocket. But soon after that, um, America got a rocket. The Sputnik was launched with an ICBM, an Intercontinental Ballistic Missile. In um, 1962, no, 1960, Gary Francis Powers flew from Pakistan into over Russia. He got shot down by a Russian missile. And so he was captured and kept until 1962 when he was exchanged for an East German spy. And um, this was a big, big thing. Sorry. So the Cold War is not quite over. Um, I think. There's some, I have some uh, headlines from recently, April, and the headline is Cold War Against Russia Without Debate. That's from uh, Yahoo. And in Cold War Echo, Obama strategy writes off Putin. That was in April of this year. Our new Cold War may emerge in Ukraine crisis, Medvedev says, the president of Russia. That's in May of this year. And Europe, Russia, ensnared in energy cold war. That's April. So basically, um, Putin in, on April 17th said that, of course, Russian servicemen backed the Crimean self-defense forces. So he's admitting that Russia was in Crimea. Uh, it's no secret. So basically, um, that's about all I have. Um, Russia and the United States seem to be fighting all the time. Of course, they had a, they probably had a conference after World War II, and they basically divided up Europe. The eastern part, Russia would take. The western part, America would take. And that's the way it's been for a long time until the uh, Soviet Union fell in 1991. And uh, so Poland and some of the other countries became part of NATO. And um, that's a story. It's a story that uh, will go on forever. And maybe uh, like Greece and Sparta or Rome and Greece, they'll be fighting and fighting and fighting until the end of time. Um, we just don't know it. And maybe when I'm dead and gone, they'll still be fighting. Um, I want to say thanks to Charlie for letting me talk. And uh, thank the college for being here. Thanks. Do you want to go through your PowerPoint and explain it? Okay, let's go. Oh. oh, yeah, did you want to? Yeah. Do you want to explain some of these? All right, yeah, I'll explain some of them. All right, this is, uh, this is Kennedy at the Berlin Wall, 1962, I think. Great, great, great. Right. Bear down that wall. No, he's, he didn't want to. No, that was Reagan. That was Reagan. Bear down that wall. Right. Yeah. And Dr. Strangelove, which is a uh, funny movie about World War, about World War III. Yep. And uh, there's a funny character in there 
who sort of looks like Kissinger. He, he, he keeps raising his arm like, like Nazi. <laughs> Yeah. That's Dr. Yeah. Strangelove. Dr. Yeah. Strangelove, yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's, 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 it's an ex-Nazi, yeah. Like <laughs> it's a very funny movie. And yeah, this is, is two great. communists. Yeah. Uh, they make <laughs> me Mao and Trump. Mao and Trump. And this was, must have been 1950. Our great leader. Right. This is the atomic bomb. It's probably a test. We were in the Pacific. This is uh, the range from where the missiles were. So this is 1,020 nautical miles in Washington, D.C. 600 miles in Savannah, Georgia. That's Reagan. He's a great warrior, supposedly. <laughs> Gorbachev, Reagan, and Bush. First Bush. Corby. That's Eisenhower, who started, helped start this this uh, Cold War. Even though he had a reputation for being peaceful, I don't. I'm not sure how that. How true yes, that is. sir. What can I do for you? This is Kissinger and Nixon. I was calling it. No, she'll just with their bunch of Yeah. Yes, Yeah. Thank you, 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 Castro. He's still alive. Yeah, he's still alive. Still alive. He's got the Kelly's prop in And this is Turkey. Uh, during the uh, Cuban during the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, part of what the Russians wanted was uh, missiles taken out of Turkey because they were. This is Russia. This is Ukraine. Russia. Kazakhstan. And this is Turkey. So uh, the Americans or NATO put missiles into Turkey. And so, as part of the concessions to the Russians, uh, the Russians taking missiles out of Cuba, the, the Americans or NATO would agree to take missiles out of Turkey. So that's like, a, I think, a thousand miles to Moscow from right the northern end of Turkey. A thousand miles to Moscow. And this is a fallout <laughs> from 1965 Soviet bombs. How the fallout would be covering the United States. It's These are classified. Yeah. Yeah. It's declassified. There's all kinds of declassified stuff on the internet. Yeah. Like this NSC-68 that was classified until 1990 or something. Snowden? Yeah, Snowden. <laughs> I'm the same as Snowden, yes. Oh, boy. That's about it. All right. Thank all right. Yeah. All right. All right. Let's go over the question. And Charlie, turn off the projector. Uh, you, you Leave it off. Yeah, you're okay. going to be the one answering the question. Right. I'll stand over here. Okay. 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 Now, um, all right. Looks like we got a whole lot of questions today. Uh, I'll, I'll start with you, Sid. Uh, what, what's your question? <laughs> question is, you gave us the history of the United States and Russian relations. Now, what is your point of view as far as who started the Cold War and why the United States won the Cold War. Mm -hmm. Do you have an opinion on that? Yeah, I, I think so. Uh, what's your first question? Why Why there was a Cold War? Who started it? Yeah, who started the Cold War? I think it was, um, well, like I said, the, the bombing of Berlin and Dresden and the firebombing of Tokyo was a, a message to the world and also to Russia that 
America could, would do whatever they want. I, I think I think it was a natural competition between Russia and America. They had the biggest armies, so I'd say America started it and Russia started it. They yeah. both started. All right. Yeah. And the way and why wait why why the it ended partly because the, the Soviet Union fell apart. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now I'd like to ask a follow-up to Sid's question because since you brought up this matter of Dresden and, and, and Tokyo and so forth um, and, and and Berlin and the, the fire bombing and so on. Now you're saying that the United States with its bomb was sending a message to Russia and to the, the world. Uh, now, you know that, now I'm sure you were aware that that at the time and since then, they maintained that, 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 that a bombing was necessary to win the war. And, and you're saying it was not and that they were sending a message. What evidence do you have? What, what message do you think they were trying to send and what evidence do you have uh, for, for, for this, what you're saying? Okay, fine. Uh, you say that there is uh, overwhelming opinion that it, it was necessary. Not, I didn't say that. Okay, I right. Didn't say that because I said that they, that's that's been the official, but that's right. that's been the official story. Right. Okay. But, well, what but I'm you saying after your allegation, I'm saying that there was great debate at the time if it was necessary. So maybe now, you know, through 50 years of of uh, history. But at the time, there was great debate. People said it was. Um, there's a, I have a quote that from the Genocide Commission that it wasn't necessary. It was, it was a war crime, in fact, that Dresden, Tokyo, uh, Berlin were war crimes. And America should have, uh, and Britain should have been a, a war criminal. All right, as another sort of follow-up. You didn't mention Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Do you consider the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki to also be a war crime? Series? We're coming up on Hiroshima Day now. Right. It's uh, August very soon. August 1945. August 6th and 9th, I think it was. Right. Um, that was the first one. Both. Well, 6th and 9th. Um, yeah, I think I think it could have been a war, considered a war crime, yes. Okay. All right. Um, Oh, well, I can ask a question. Uh, uh, if you have some, if you have a comment, well, wait, wait, Yannabas, if you have a comment to make, you can do it during your rebuttal no, period. This is time for questions. If you have read the uh, very significant book, about 800 pages, by Dar Al Perovitz, uh, a famous professor who spells it all out, how it was fabricated to uh, drop the atomic bomb, and uh, there was no military need for it. Do, have you heard of Gar Al Perovitz, yes. the decision to yes. drop the bomb? Okay, I'm asking my friend uh, uh, if he has heard of it. Sure, but this is this. Okay, okay yeah, but I, I actually had not. Answer. I had not, but it, let's let it be documented. Okay, I've heard of the, the name. I've heard. I know he's a historian. Um, right. I mean, I think there's a debate. Uh, there are both sides of the issue. It, was it necessary to bomb to, to drop the atomic bomb? Um, Japan was probably losing the war. And there, uh, Dresden, <clears throat> Dresden had no military. Well, it had military factories, but it, uh, it, I think it had no aircraft, anti-aircraft uh, guns, so they they couldn't defend themselves. And uh, many of the there had no basements in the city. Well, the city had basements, but no air air raid shelters because they didn't think they were going to get bombed. So people went to the basements. And uh, were killed, basically. So more than a hundred thousand people were killed. Now the great author Kurt Vonnegut, he was on his book uh, Slaughterhouse Five. Slaughterhouse Five was where he survived the Dresden firebombing. It was deep underground. It was like 60 feet underground. It was a huge uh, slaughterhouse, uh, refrigerated slaughterhouse. His job was to take dead bodies out of. Uh, he was a big guy, about 6'3", big. So he, he was recruited to, he was in the army, he was recruited to carry bob bodies out of basements, dead bodies, and they were burning them. So I mean, war is hell, war is hell. But at the time, you could debate uh, tactics, strategy, forever. And this is a good place to have it, I think. Okay, um, Karina, do you have a question? 
since World War II, um, China has drastically changed. Uh, you were talking about the United States and Russia fighting until the end of time, like the Spartans and the Athens. What, what effect does China have? That's a good question. China is uh, getting stronger and stronger. It'll be the biggest economy in the world pretty soon. But they haven't been imperialistic very much. Uh, they haven't gone out and conquered other countries, or overtly, at least. Uh, and like Russia and the United States has. But I mean, they're in, in Africa now, as you know, I'm sure. Um, it could be a three-way, three-way, uh, four-way. Uh, America, Russia, China, and, and England, or, or France, or Germany. Can you describe China's relationship with uh, Russia, I guess, or the soup? Well, it's, it's cooperative, it's, it's competitive, I think, also. I mean, they're, they're neighbors, they're right next to each other. Uh, they haven't fought too many wars with each other, but they've done proxy wars, I think. Uh, I'm not sure how that'll turn out. All right, um, Charlie, do you have a question? Yeah, Dan, do you think all federal employees should take the same oath the president does to show that they're not commies? <laughs> Wait, do they have to? Yes? No. Um, yeah, are they the only, they're the only employees that do that, right? No. Well, all right, let's expand it. Do you think everyone should take that oath? No, I don't. Did you, I don't, I'm a member of the Communist Party of Illinois. Uh oh. Oh. No. Oh. Right. Oh. Soulmate for each other. Oh. Oh. Charlie, you're in love. You snuck him in. So, I mean, the NSA might be listening to everything, all He's my phone calls. Comrade. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, right I'm just I'm just learning about it. I'm just doing it to learn. Yeah. All right, go on. Okay, uh, all right. Uh, did you have a, hey, you have a question? Okay, great. Go ahead. What's this genocide commission that you first? All right, let me find it. All right. Here you go, honey. Yes, Genocide Watch, sort of like, uh, su uh, not Suicide Watch, um, yeah. Democracy Watch, Gen it's called Genocide Watch. Okay, what is that? Gregory Stanton, I'm not sure who will it I'm already doing it. You're doing it? Okay. Yeah, um, genocidewatch.org, they're, uh, it's now genocidewatch.net, basically it's a, a a website and a bunch of people that watch for upcoming genocides. Uh, for example, some of the headlines, France says Central African Republic on verge of genocide. Unspeakable horrors in the country on the verge of genocide. And they got several articles and places that will, will, will it's just watches for it around the world. Genocidewatch.net. Who remembers the Armenians? All right, Gene, uh, did you have a <coughs> You mentioned that the uh, United States and Russia, it almost sounded like you said, they both started the Cold War. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is, uh, when you have a, a standoff like that, it's for a reason. You hinted at it when you said that the United States had did this thing with the bombs and, and Hiroshima and so forth and so forth. However, by the time the Cold War started in front of it, uh, Russia had the atomic bomb. Right. Now, my question is, and I'm asking the question because we all here know that ain't nothing favor a government more than having a uh, citizen thinking a booger man is over there. that go for Russia and that go for the United States. Right. Now, could this Cold Wall be based on what I just said, which would make, for me, would make it a phony Cold Wall. Right. Well, like I said, the, the title of this 
was the myth of the Cold War. You're right. I'd say the, the whole purpose of government, part of the whole purpose is to fight wars. I mean, governments are good at war. You know, people like us in this group are not going to go start a war with Moscow, I don't think. We don't have the money, we don't have the time, we don't have the energy. But the government, love they, Moscow here. Right. But a government, they have the, uh, the National Security Council, and all they do is plan war. So, of course, you're right. And then they get corporations like Martin Marietta and whatever, Boeing, to build these bonds. And it's a big, big book business. And they hire their friends and their relatives and... Big happy party. Provide for the common defense. Uh, all right. Defense. Uh, all right. Uh, it, oh, yes, Ernie. Yeah. Uh, tell us your opinion on the effect that the Cold War had on uh, American foreign policy, particularly the Korean War, the Vietnam War, uh, and any other effects it had on our foreign policy. Okay. Well, the Korean War, I'd say, was. Sure, from the Cold War, um, China China was in that war a little bit, or a lot. Um, not, I don't know that much about it. But of course, Kennedy helped start Vietnam, sending advisors over. Um, Johnson uh, expanded the war a lot. Uh, Russia, probably, or China, was supplying uh, North Vietnam. So it was, it was really part of the Cold War, I'd say. Um, proxy war. Proxy war. Yeah. All right. Sure. Um, sir, did you have a question? Yeah. What about these uh, clandestine <coughs> agencies like uh, MK Ultra, um, Operation Paperclip, um, Area Fifty One? How uh -huh. how the technologies? Uh, with off balance on our side and, and some of the agencies in Russia. I'm not familiar with those. I'm not familiar with those three. Really. You mentioned MK Ultra and, and Operation Paperclip. Yes. Uh, and what was what was the other one? Well, Area 51. Oh, Area 51. Oh, right, right, Technology. Right, right, right. 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 Yeah, recruit Nazis on our side, but yeah. some of them went to, to Russia. That, that was Operation Paperclip. Good Nazis, welcome to the U.S. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, all right. Anybody else have a question? Oh, yes, sir. Didn't Eisenhower also send some advisors over to Vietnam? Yeah, I think he did, right. He sent a few Yes. All right. Uh, Brown. Yes. Uh, how how would America or Britain or France or whatever I do. I'm gonna show it. prosecute the war without Russia, the Second World War? Uh, didn't they bear the, the brunt of uh, the, both the suffering and the, uh, the, the fighting? Yeah, they did. I think um, I read somewhere that if, if Russia had lost in the east, if, if uh, the Germans had conquered Russia in the east part of Russia, they would, the Americans wouldn't have cared too much. They would have probably fought the Germans in Russia then, but they wanted to see Russia fail even in World War II. Um, I mean, not too much, because they were fighting the Germans and they did a good job, of, uh, even though they lost a lot of people. Uh, but there, there was competition even in World War II, I think you're right. And to follow up, uh, why did the Russians not advance uh, uh, when they were just outside of Warsaw and the uh, Polish Home Army had taken over Warsaw? I don't know about that. I can answer that question. The Russians went through the wrong hole. This is two dollars. It's the sun. 
for the whole thing. Um, all right. Any other questions? Okay. What part of your analysis could possibly explain your marrying your beautiful Russian wife? I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> they have an unserious question. Well, no, 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 no. she has a good connection to Brezhnev. And yeah, right. Then you know what? Oh, oh my! Oh, sure. You have to do something to copy this. No, I'm not. You tell them you're a certifiable clown. I don't have no connection. I just, you know, I'm so happy. All right. Stupid joke. Thank you. All right, Judy. Did you have a question? Because I'm beautiful. Uh, no. no, okay, okay, not shaking your hand. Jim. All right, um, all right. Uh, Charlie. Yes, can't, can't the Cold War be traced back to the capitalist, fascist, Wall Street money mongers <laughs> to keep <laughs> communism out of the no, you know, United you know, I States? Could, Charlie, Charlie, Charlie. <laughs> I searched Jewish history on the, on the internet. And you know what comes up? A lot of anti-Semitic stuff. Yeah. So if you want to blame the Jews, I was here, wait, let me say No, sorry. the capitalist. <laughs> the capitalist, Same the thing, capitalist, right? and Wall, Wall Street. Street. Nothing to do with Jews. Oh, okay. Wall Street, right, well, think... the, the manufacturers, to, after the revolution, <clears throat> the manufacturers wanted, were fearful of communism. Isn't that when it began? They didn't. They saw what was going on in Russia. They yeah, didn't. but America had its own interests. I mean, the the Marshall Plan, for instance. No, no. This is 1917. Oh, 1917. Uh, going back right. after the revolution. Right. They saw what was going on in Russia. How do you think they reacted? It was also the government. You could blame the government and the Wall Street. I think both, or maybe they're the same thing. <laughs> All right. Uh, now, is there anybody else who has a question who has not already asked a question? It's right there. Okay. Oh, Mike, go ahead. Uh, I just want to, toward the end of your lecture, you mentioned this idea that the United States and Russia both agreed with each other that they wouldn't bother each other in their own sphere of influence, so to speak. Each one got to do what it wanted, and the other one wouldn't. Is there any kind of writings or anything about if this is just a situation that just evolved, or if the two countries actually got together, you know, the leadership of the country right. actually got together and said, we won't bother you That's a good question. in your own right. Right. satellite country, right. you don't bother us in right. your own colony. Right. Um, I'm not sure. Some declassified documents might be coming out soon. It's been about 50 or 60 years uh, since 1945. Oh look, I mean that picture of Stalin and Roosevelt and Churchill yeah. sitting together like buddies. I mean that, that means something to me. I mean they didn't talk about uh, what they're going to eat. They talked about the world and how they're going to divide it up. So I would say yeah. I mean and maybe somebody was taking notes and maybe those notes will be printed someday. Okay. Um, all right. Let's see. Tim. Speculate for a minute. What is the future of Russia? Future Russia. What do you think? What I thought, I yeah. thought, um, okay, my opinion, what I understand right now, it's Russia, it's not the same like it's used to be. And I guess um, probably Russia gonna be uh, go like apart with so many, uh, so many topics and so many people, different nationality. And I don't think it's gonna be like Russia like used to. It's it's more like foreign country because it's many right now Muslims occupied, you know, many okay. different uh, but it's not like used to, to be Soviet Union, something. you understand? It's not but Russia is you know that hopefully they strong. Okay. Let me, let me say something. I'll say something. Uh, Russia is in in Ukraine in uh, Crimea or Krim. As the Russians say? <laughs> anyway, so Russia, I mean, they're involved with Ukraine. They're arming the Ukrainians. I saw a, a news thing where America gave $8 million to Ukraine to help support their border. So, I mean, um, Russia is in active. They're involved with countries. And I think they'll go on, as long as Putin is president. Maybe if Putin goes, there might be a more peaceful Russia. Okay. Uh, Judy? 
Right. I may ha he just may have answered my question. Because oh. I thought Medvedev was the president. Did you find the other way up? He is the president, but no, but he's vice president. Yeah, because I was going to ask yeah. how much control and or influence does Putin still have? Like, a lot. So, is it, he's a president. is it Medvedev like a puppet of Putin? Yeah, but Putin is a president. Did you now. make another ball? I know because our guys met with Putin. Right. Minestrone or chicken? Yes, yeah, strong man. Yeah, strong yeah, strong man. Okay, uh, Don. Oh, this is what they do. Yes, sir. Question. Just Give me a Sunday. That, the the no, people are all ready to talk about it. But you think the uh, going to have to go? Mm -hmm. uh, I think he's no, going to be too. What do you got, Kate? Not yeah. 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 Some of them are going to be too. I know, that's the last of it. Right. Okay, you bring it. I need to bring it. In Russia, they call it Pootler. 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 I don't think so. No. But uh, he's been president about 12 years now, or some, some number. I know, it's for a six-year term. So uh, he's he's been powerful for a long time. Uh, I'm not sure who is who he has after him, but we'll see. All right. Um, all right, is there anybody else who has a question? Who has not already asked a question? Uh, okay. Andy. Oh, Andy, go ahead. In uh, your research, did you uh, run across uh, General Smedley Butler's book from 1935 describing uh, that war is a racket? That it's, no. it's mainly for the profits of big corporations. Did your other research uh, dig up that uh, no. general thread at all? <laughs> well, I think I got it from just how the government was excited to set up the NSC and all these uh, secret documents that made the war were were uh, plans for war. So I mean that I I keep I think I learned that government is very good at war and they do it they do it well. Okay. Um, all right. I um, all right. Who, let's see who else. Mike, did you have a question? No. Okay. Ernie. Um, Ernie. 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 Go ahead. Yeah, that's the second question. Uh, regarding Putin's uh, longevity, uh, what are what are his popularity levels now? How can, can we trust oh. polls that come out of Russia? We, no. the, the Russians seem to like uh, strong leaders. And, right. Uh, would he win an election uh, tomorrow if there were one? Or, I, I, think, I think. I think. I think it's eighty percent. Eighty percent. Eighty percent possible. Okay. Right. Uh, yeah. That's a crazy. Right? So maybe he would. Yeah. What What are your chances for Gary Kasparov becoming president of Russia? Not very good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. All right. They don't play Chester anymore. All right. All right. Now. Uh, it's more like go. Right. Yeah. Charlie, did you have an, another question? Yeah. You. Uh, I seem to recollect that one of the inherent functions of government is to provide for the common defense, Dan. Right. Now, you had a photo of it, an old commie up there, Khrushchev, who said, we're going to bury you. Right. And I guess yeah. you will let him, right? Because no. you wouldn't have any army and... No. Right? No, I mean, Kennedy... We listen to you and... Okay, Charlie. All right. No, I don't think you're right, Charlie. No. <laughs> okay, Brom. At the end of World War II, uh, the United States was untouched and uh, militarily prepared and uh, on top of the world, really. Uh, but uh, the rest of the world was pretty flat. Right. Uh, either very underdeveloped. Uh, in colonies uh, run by uh, uh, very weak uh, European powers, or, or or they were uh, completely underdeveloped. So, so uh, what was the appeal of the uh, Soviets uh, or the communists? Uh, what was the appeal of uh, the capitalists? I think I think part of the reason, like Czechoslovakia, Hungary, uh, Poland, um, 
like uh, Yugoslavia. They, part of it was the Russian army. They came in and they said, you know, do this or we'll blow you up. And also partly it was by proximity. They were closer to Russia than they were to France or Germany. Okay. I'd argue a little bit about Yugoslavia. They uh, had somewhat liberated themselves and uh, uh, were, right. while friendly to All right. the Russians. All right. That would be a, that would be a good topic for for a rebuttal speech, Brown. Go. Uh, do you have a question, Karina? Um, theoretical question. Um, ISIS, uh, the Iraq State. <coughs> well, anyway, they they become a. They, they really start conquering other nations. Do you think the United States and Russia would act as allies? Mm -hmm. In letting them? Let's say that ISIS uh, started to attack Turkey. Mm -hmm. Would NATO or and Russia work? Or? Probably. I'd say they work together. They might. Well, then again, they might not. I don't, um, Turkey is a member of NATO. Okay. So... Um, it, if they attacked uh, like Kuwait, something like that, or Saudi Arabia, I think America would step in or NATO would step in. I mean, NATO has been in Iraq, Afghanistan, Ukraine. So, uh, but ISIS is in Iraq and Syria. Syria and Iraq. Ukraine and NATO? No. Oh. But I mean, like, Archie Yeah. That's okay. But ISIS uh, stated they wanted to establish a caliphate. You know, that would he go up to Spain, um, cover parts of Croatia. Turkey. Would that Malta? be cooperative co with cooperation oh, between the United States and Russia, no. or no. You, know, you, want, um, no. you don't That's think we would cooperate yeah. together to no, Mocha? Okay. No, I won't do that. All right, Judy, did you have another question? Okay, go ahead. Are you going to say something else? What? Yeah. No, Dan. And then... No, Archie. Okay, sorry. All right, Judy, did you have another question? Yes, if you were advising the president yeah. today from the current state of affairs with Ukraine, what would you advise the president wait, to wait, do? Wait, maybe the, which president, Judy? This president. Oh, oh the Obama? United States. Obama? Yes, yeah. yeah. Mr. Obama. Yeah. <coughs> He's a communist, he's a Marxist. Yeah, I would think that Dan would I thought you'd approve, Charlie. Putin. You would consider Putin your president. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Russia's, Russia's your country now. I mean, not the, it's no. You're not. You're no, not. No, no, you're, 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 my the, passport you're says, White Sox, not the Cubs. No, the passport, my passport still says okay, America. Okay, but the, <laughs> the, the, <laughs> the heart line. I'm not asking you the question. No, no, no. All right, so, <laughs> so <laughs> America already to Obama. <laughs> America, America has already given eight million dollars, according to RT News. Okay. Um, eight million out uh, yesterday. I saw the news. Yeah. Gave eight million for to, to protect the to the border, which means to fight Russia, basically. And so um, I would I would say if I don't want to get kicked out of the room, I'd say yeah, give more money to Ukraine. Because there's also reports here that Russia is giving and has been giving weapons to the ethnic Russian rebels in Ukraine. Sure, of course. So I, I don't know what to do here. I just want to know what you would do. Well, I think it's just like Vietnam or like Korea. Korea. It's a proxy war. Two little countries fighting each other, and but it's really by the big guys holding the strings. The puppets. The puppets. All right. All right, Gene. Right. Right. Uh, you didn't print this, but it's uh, uh, part of what we go by. It said the myth of the Cold Wall. Uh -huh. uh, could you, uh, like I said, you might not had nothing to do with this, but if you did, what is the myth? The myth is that that it's some great competition, and you saw. Uh, Churchill, Stalin, and Roosevelt sitting there. So, I mean, they, the myth is that um, they're in some big competition, but like some people say, uh, they really do cooperate. 
in the world. They allow each other certain areas and they don't bother each other too much. And that's it. They cut a deal. All right, can I, I'd like to ask a follow-up question to Gene's. Now, if, if you're saying that, that, that the Cold War, as we understand it, is a myth, and that basically the, the United States and the USSR had a live and let live policy, then, then how do you explain things like how do you explain things like the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Cuban Missile Crisis? How do you how do you explain? I mean, those to me, just to me, I'm, I, they, those look like fights over turf. Right, you're right, but they uh, also for 70 years there was no atomic war, which is true, which I can say, and. Those were little problems. There was the Cuban Missile Crisis, Vietnam, Korea War. No problems. Little problems. <laughs> because the big problem would be when ICBMs come on Chicago or New York or LA or Moscow or Leningrad. That's a big war. So these are little wars. Just just when Vietnam is destroyed or Korea is destroyed or 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 or. Uh, Cuba is cut off from the rest of the world. Well, Vietnam was pretty cool. But you're saying so what you're saying is that compared to what World War Three might have been, Vietnam was relatively small. Is that what you're yes, pointing? And what you're Korea doing. too, that's the point you're making. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Does anybody else have a question? Uh, Ernie, did you have another question? I, I did not. Okay, point. okay. I think one. All right. Um, all right, I, you, um, you said that Russia was forced to get its own bomb uh, because of the U.S. getting, uh, getting the bomb. Um, now, maybe I'm way off base here, but I seem to recall that that the, the Soviet Union had had spies working within the U.S. to pass atomic secrets to the Russians while World War II was going on and the USSR was ostensibly still an ally of the United States. That, yes. In fact, of course, that was what the yes. Rosenbergs were convicted of. Yes. Uh, so what, uh, what would you say about that? Well, uh, there's a lot of uh, stealing of secrets. Mm -hmm. um, What was the question? Okay, my question is, is, is what would you, okay, because you're saying that, you're saying that, that Russia was forced to get a bomb because the United States had one, mm -hmm. but, but we have, we okay. have, but we, but the, actually the Soviet Union was working on getting an atomic bomb while World War II was still going on, the United States had its own atomic program but had not yet perfected the bomb, right. and so, so what, what would you, you know, how, how would you explain that? Maybe forced, you... maybe forced is the wrong word. Okay. Uh, I'd say they were in competition <coughs> with America. So, uh, and the, the uh, like some of the Nazi uh, scientists, instead of coming to America, like Werner von Braun, they went to Russia. Mm -hmm. It was a lot closer to go. They didn't have to go so far. Yeah. Uh, so... I mean, and they also were taken by Russians to Moscow or wherever they were doing research. And America took them to New Mexico and do the, do the research. Um, so well, Russia wasn't forced to, but I mean, if they were going to compete equally, they would have to have a problem. But those, the, those German scientists going to the USSR and the US. That happened after the war with Germany ended. That right. was not, that it happened after VE Day. I'm talking about events that occurred before VE Day. The fact that, this, that, the, that the Soviets mm -hmm. had espionage activities that going on inside the US military while yeah. World War II was going on before VE Day. At, okay, but anyway. Right, right. So, um, well, if, the thing is that what about Russia had the first uh, rocket. They had the first uh, um, Sputnik. Sputnik, and that was before America. So don't yeah. you think? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you think that America had spies in Russia doing 
uh, and the research for Sputnik, America would have spies in Russia. Too. No, one would certainly hope so. Yeah, right. So okay. I mean, so from the Russian perspective, they have to have spies here, and America has to have yeah. spies yeah. there. Yeah. All right. All uh, fair. All right. Fair. Now, does anybody else? Does yeah. anybody else? Have, yes, sir. Can I add a comment here? Yeah. I mean. The question of well, well, if will Russia well, well, develop? Well, if I may, if I may just a moment, oh, wow. sir. I'm uh, this is actually time for questions. If you, if you no, I'm just want to make a comment. If you wish to give a that's comment, you can do so period. during the rebuttal period. period. Yeah, we're going to have a rebuttal yeah, period yeah, where everybody can get up. Okay, you can speak. The comment period is next. Yeah, we're going to have a rebuttal period. Now, does anybody else have a question? Yannimus, you had your hand up. Did you want to put my two cents on the rebuttal? Oh, you want to give a rebuttal speech? Okay. Why don't you scoop down? Okay. okay. All right. Does anybody else have a question? Yeah. All right, Charlie. Yeah. Am I correct that you said the Soviet Union won World War II, and no. your implication so, was the United States kind of yeah. just happened to be around or something? No, I didn't mean that. Or well, wouldn't wouldn't have fought? No, I didn't mean that. <laughs> All right. All right. Now. Um, okay. He has. Yes, well, yes sir. Why isn't there any talk about uh, like the Pope's influence or the Jesuits' influence on the Cold War? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The Society of Jesuits. Pope or the Jesuits? I'm not aware of that. Yeah. Well, yeah. You can email me. Okay. I'll give you my email. All right. Tell All right. Now, did anybody else have any questions? All right. If there are no other questions, then let's have another warm round of applause for our speaker. period now and I don't have I, I don't have my cheat sheet here so I'm gonna need Tim to help me out with this. First of all, um, I what I need is a show of hands. Uh, except for those of you who are already sitting in the chairs, I know you wants to be a communist. Right. Who yeah, who wants to speak on behalf of this country, Russia? I, I'm just kidding. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, uh, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, 12, 13, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it, uh, I, I got you, Dan, I got you, I'm going to make it 14. Now, how much time, we've got uh, an hour and 15 minutes. Go with about five minutes Five minutes each, each? okay, all right, so five minutes for, for each person. So, uh, Dave, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Tim, can I ask you to put that clip back on there, please? Which one? Which one? The ones that we were showing before. Which one? Stooges? Which one? No, after Stooges. Well, we're all shut down. Sorry. Can you do that, Tim? Uh, actually, he's got his computer off and the projector's turned down. Okay. Just go ahead and... Uh, when... What did you say? Just tell us when you were going to talk. It doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, as long as he can't show it, there's nothing to say. Uh, I wanted to say, though, that uh, uh, one thing that wasn't talked about here tonight at all was that uh, when uh, Harry Truman and uh, Stalin and Winston Churchill met in Potsdam and were dividing up the spoils of war as to what country, as to who's going to get what countries, uh, Truman was informed that we now had the atomic bomb full force, ready to go. No ifs, ands, or buts. Now, we had an agreement with uh, Russia that uh, we were going to help Russia defeat Germany, and Russia was going to help us defeat Japan once we cleaned up the Germans. So Truman, being a, uh, a pretty smart guy, really, he told uh, Stalin after the meeting ended, he said, by the way, he says, I've been informed that we have some new uh, weapons, and I was wondering what you thought about us deploying them. And Stalin said, oh yeah, sure, go ahead, use them. Use them against the Japanese, <laughs> as he walked away. Well. In other words, Stalin gave his consent for us to use the atomic bomb unwittingly. When uh, we did use the atomic bomb against the Japanese, 
we actually did Japan a very big favor. Hey, Japan. Shit, wait, one, one pull at a time. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we actually did Japan a very big favor because, one, when, uh, uh, if we would not have used the atomic bomb, uh, it would have taken us another six months or so to, to, to finish up with Japan, and then we would have had to allow the, the uh, Russians to come in and help us with them, and then Russia would have demanded a piece of Japan, just as they had done with the other thing, and they would have said, well, we fought too, we're entitled to a piece of it. So uh, then there not only later would have come about a Berlin Wall, but there would have been perhaps a Tokyo Wall. Considering that Japan and Russia had a war in something like 1903 or 1905, and, and Japan beat the daylights out of Russia and won that war, uh, Stalin had his tongue hanging out for Japan, and he would have loved, he was a very bloodthirsty kind of person, he would have loved to have gotten his claws on Japan and to have really made blood flow there, uh, okay. if for no other reason, in retaliation of the uh, Russo-Japanese War of 1903 or 1905. Uh, the the uh, wind-up was that uh, the, the fact that Truman tricked Stalin, this is what touched off the Cold War. Uh, after all, Russia and America had been allies during the war, and we helped Russia, and Russia helped us, but Stalin felt that he had been tricked by, uh, by Truman, and that's what really touched off the Cold War. That was never mentioned here tonight, because it's wrong. but that is what, what created the Cold War, because then it went on from there, it continued to escalate. Uh, that is really about all I've got to say. Thank you. I was born in the Appalachian part of Greece, south of Athens and north of Sparta in a remote little mountain village, and the only part, I, I lived through the, I'm most probably one of the few people here who lived through World War II, but I was too young to understand what was going on, and I still don't know what happened. Mm -hmm. We only saw the war one day when the Germans came in to burn our village. But uh, the other thing is, I've also lived through the Cuban Missile Crisis, 20 years later or so after the Second World War, when I came here on the boat in 46. I was drafted, and uh, I, uh, almost became a hero in the invasion of Cuba, which I, if I were uh, in that aggressive uh, military expedition, I would be ashamed to tell people, just like I would be ashamed to tell people if I had served in the Vietnam War. I would never tell anybody. The greatest hero of the Vietnam War is a man that lives in Chicago, I believe, still. Muhammad Ali. He was the greatest hero. He refused to go and kill small, little, defenseless people in Asia and murder people because America never fought a war of defense. They know how to fight in the land, in the sea, in the air. But they never knew how to fight a war of defense. They never had to fight a war of defense. Every ever so often they blow up a ship or they fabricate a tank and golf or they blow up the twin towers just to find an excuse to wage wars of aggression. These are the only wars the U.S. knows how to fight. And my dad was in World War I. He came back with a super heart. I almost went to Cuba during the Cuban Missile Crisis. So I wound up having a two-month vacation in Miami. But the thing is, I was a court tactic in the Joint Evergreen Corps. But the U.S is one of the three great powers. One great power is in Washington. This gentleman here, I take off my hat to him. He's taking his hat. He's wearing his hat, the black hat. This gentleman said, the Vatican and Catholic Church. That's the second great power, the Vatican. 2,000 years of power. And the third great power is Israel. And they're demonstrating their power for the third time in the 20th century by waging war 
against people who cannot defend themselves. Okay. You should have paid 1125. This is true to the... 1125 was what? Dogma of uh, King David. Was Always attack the other guy when okay. he cannot defend Stop. himself okay. and kill him from a safe distance. 3,000 years later, it's the same thing again. So me, I'm talking like an independent Greek-American pro-communist. And you know, I'm grateful to the communists because when we were dying and starving in World War II, Roosevelt and the Americans did not save us, Churchill and the British did not save us, the people who saved us was a man born Joseph Mr. Ionovich Chubashvili, known in history as Joseph Stalin. They saved us. And they saved you. They saved your fathers, mothers, grandmothers, and grandfathers if you come from Europe. They are the ones that saved your people, the Europeans. We were not Europeans, we were Balkans. So now there's a new war of aggression being planned, again by the aggressors, the West, the Germans, the US, British, and what they're planning is to encircle Russia with atomic bombs even closer. And there's only one country left. The only country left is Belarus. Once they topple that million of 10 million pro-Russian people, then the news, the military news around Russia will be complete. And Hitler's Lebensraum agenda to take over the vast land of 11 time zones will be a fait accompli. And there will be the end of one powerful opponent of American and European imperialism. You see, 90% of military strategy is logistics. And an army travels on a stomach. I think the best way to apply that kind of strategy all these issues of military and political spending is to get rid of the central bank and the income tax, which are basically the backbone of the corporate welfare state. Now, I've been uh, put together a uh, An open letter to Charles Koch, which uh, sort of outlines these ideas. And uh, uh, has a big list of readings on related topics. And one of them I suggest is Orwell's War is Peace. You know, yeah. Which I think is about the best uh, encapsulation of atomic strategy or, or political strategy over the coming decades, and most of which has come true. But he figured there would be three superpowers in constant war with each other. And I also think this is about uh, fighting wars not to design not to win anything, which again I think is about the best explanation for the Vietnam War. Uh, but anyway, uh, Alexis de Tocqueville wrote in uh, Democracy in America that he, in 1835, he could see the U.S. and Russia as being uh, competitor, the major competitors in the future, and uh, uh, anyway, uh, I mean, there's a lot of things to be said here, but uh, I guess that's about it for now.
and then I'm collecting emails. Anybody wants this email and maybe a couple others, just give me your email address. Next. I'm Michael Foley. I want to say something about this idea that the Soviet Empire has collapsed, or the Soviet Union has collapsed, or USSR is no longer. Now, supposedly, allegedly, the Soviet Union collapsed somewhere around 1990 or something like that. And I'll say, maybe it did. But it sure didn't take them long to get back on its feet. In 2008, there was a NATO meeting. It was held in Bucharest, Romania. There was, at the time, there was 26 countries in the NATO alliance. And what was on the agenda was the United States wanted the NATO countries to vote to expand NATO to include Ukraine and Georgia. Not Georgia down there by Atlanta, but that Georgia country that got over there next to Russia. That was what was on the agenda. The United States wanted the NATO alliance to extend membership to Ukraine and Georgia. Both those countries, by the way, border on the nation of Russia. Now, as part of the NATO rigmarole, bureaucracy, or alliance, or whatever you want to call it, Russia, they're not a part of NATO, but they send diplomats to NATO, and they have diplomats interacting with the NATO rigmarole. At this meeting in Bucharest, Romania, the Russian diplomats spoke to the ministers of the NATO nations and said, Russia did not want the NATO alliance to extend membership to Ukraine and Georgia. The nation of Russia did not want Ukraine and Georgia to be joining NATO. The United States did want Ukraine and Georgia to be joining NATO. But Russia didn't want it. So when they voted, the NATO alliance voted to not extend membership to Ukraine and Georgia. The countries of the NATO alliance <laughs> voted in favor of Russia and they what they wanted, and they defied the wishes of the United States of America. They were led in this act by France and Germany. Now I'll stand here and say that the countries that we know, the countries in the world that we know as Western Europe, what we know as Western Europe, those countries are lackey slave colonies of Russia. Those countries are lackey slave colonies and part of the Soviet Empire, the Russian Empire, whatever you want to call it. France is a lackey slave colony of Russia. <coughs> Germany is a lackey slave colony of Russia. Italy is a lackey slave colony of Russia. Greece, Turkey, all the little ones, Belgium and Portugal and all the small ones, they are all lackey slave colonies of Russia. They are part of the Russian Empire. Yeah. And that's because Russia is selling them natural gas and oil. And they won't open their mouth, not a peep out of one of them. Now, this is not very apparent because people from this country can go to Europe and travel around France and Italy and Belgium and Germany and all that. Have yourself a wonderful vacation. But they will not say one word against anything that's done by Russia. And by the way, thank you, Alana. Really, I mean it for, no, really, for really, comment. No, thank no, you. Right. Anyway, I want to say one thing about Israel and Palestine. I'm just so glad you know history of Russia very well. Thank you so much. And thank you. Of time. I want to say one thing about Israel and Palestine. I'm not going to say who's right or who's wrong. I'm not going to say anything about it except don't Hello? forget one thing. Everybody that's being killed in Israel right now and everybody that's being killed in Palestine right now is being killed by us. Every adult in the United States, including me, is killing people in Israel and Palestine right now because my money's paying for it and the money of all of us is paying for it. Our government takes our ta tax money 
and gives money to Israel and says, go kill people in Palestine, and they do. Our government gives money to people in Palestine. It's humanitarian aid, but they say, Here, here's humanitarian aid. you got to spend it on schools and hospitals. But you can take your own money. Take your own money and buy weapons and go kill people in Israel. And they're doing it. We, the people of this country, are bankrolling both sides in that war. We're not shooting the rifles, but we're paying for the rifles, we're paying for the bullets, we're paying for the soldiers, we're paying for the tanks, the airplanes, every, every person, every adult in this country is killing people in Israel and Palestine right now. Now, I object to that. Whatever Israel and Palestine do is up to them. There's no reason why I should have to pay for all that killing, and I'm opposed to it. I also said there's no reason why all the rest of the people in this country should have to pay for all that killing. I'm opposed to that too. That's all I'm going to say about the situation over there. Thank okay. you. Oh, Thanks, Lord. Okay, we got One has to look at um, concrete, objective facts to understand anything. And if we look at the facts, actually the Cold War actually started out as a hot war. After the Russian Revolution, 14 imperialist powers attacked the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union at that time didn't attack anybody. And it was under General Graves' expeditionary forces that landed in Vladivostok and invaded the Soviet Union with 13 other imperialist powers. That was actually the beginning of the Cold War. These are cold, concrete, objective facts. Now, some say the Cold War started after the Second World War. It actually started after, actually after the Russian Revolution. And the United States didn't recognize the, the Soviet Union until about after Roosevelt came into power. If we look at other concrete objective facts, we look at the basis surrounding the Soviet Union. And this was after the communists, of course, came to power. And this was in, not in the, uh, <coughs> you know, the Socialist Workers' Party or the Communist uh, People's Workers' Party. This was in what magazine? And it showed 250 bases surrounding the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. Now, who was the aggressor? Where was the basis surrounding the United States by the Soviet Union? There wasn't even one. Not even one. And the United States became an imperialist power during the Spanish-American War against Cuba, against the Philippines, and against the other countries. And we were an imperialist power at that point in history. The Soviet Union was attacked before, you know, by the Germans during the Second World War. So as a, as a precaution, once they took over these countries surrounded the Soviet Union, they wanted to have uh, like a cordon sanitaire protecting them against further invasions. You have to remember the Soviet Union was invaded by Napoleon, invaded by Germany. And these are concrete facts. Now what is happening in the Ukraine? Let's look at this closely. In the Ukraine, there was supposed to be an election in December. But what happened was the reactionaries and the fascists that helped Hitler during the Second World War, the Ukrainian fascists, overthrew the government there. Not only that, but there was a, 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 a treaty signed by Gorbachev and the American president at that time that the United States 
would not take over these countries that were formerly part of the Soviet bloc. And they took them over and they put in NATO. And they said they weren't going to do that. So you have aggression right there. They're up to the, uh, the Russian border right now. And who's supporting them is the United States. The United States hates communism. There's no doubt about that. It's been proven for a, long, a very long period of time. But they go off fascism. You look over Latin America, they installed fascist regimes. You look at Greece, the Greek junta was a fascist regime. In the Philippines, a fascist regime. And now they're on the border of Russia. This is more or less, the United States has become the fourth Reich that it was, has, has, bec has become. And we're in danger of a third world war because Russia has atom atomic weaponry and it has ballistic missiles. We're threading in a very dangerous spot. They could start World War III and it's the fault of the imperialist powers okay. led by the United States. All right. <laughs> Well, Dan's, uh, Dan's talk was very timely, uh, considering what's right on in the world, and tomorrow we can go to the movie and learn about World War I while we're at it. Uh, what I'm going to do tonight is, is attempt to deliver a summary of the gist of a speech I made about 20 years ago uh, at Toastmasters. The title of that speech was In Defense of Adolf Hitler. Now, before, before I raise too many hackles, uh, on this, let me tell you a little bit about Toastmasters. You've got a Toastmaster who's the master of ceremonies, and then each speaker has an evaluator who talks about, who, who evaluates the speech more from the technical point of view. And you've got one than tonight. Point. What's that? You've got one tonight. What's that? You've got an evaluator tonight. Oh, I do. Oh, wonderful. I'll Great. go up for one or two minutes after you're done. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah, I've been out of Toastmasters for a while, but what I wanted to say is both of these folks were Jewish the night I gave this talk, and I got the best evaluation perhaps in the entire time I spent in Toastmasters for that talk. Uh, a, truly a better title for the talk would not have been in defense of, but explaining the rise of Adolf Hitler, or uh, what ye sow, so shall ye reap. And I, I want to talk briefly about the three big wars of the 20th century. Number one, number two, and the Cold War, and specifically how the victors behaved toward the vanquished and how that affected history uh, in the ensuing years. World War I, the, uh, the uh, Allies subjugated, oppressed, humiliated the, the uh, Germans, uh, demanded reparations, took away a lot of their ability to, to uh, get those reparations with taking their rail cars and various other things that they did. Uh, as a result of this behavior and the way they treated the Germans, a certain very hard-nosed nationalist leader by the name of Adolf Hitler was able to rise to power. We all know what happened as a result of that. Uh, that led into World War II and 20 or 30 million deaths. Now, contrast that with the end of World War II, where we embraced the uh, defeated. Uh, we worked with them. We helped them get back and recover. We had the Marshall Plan. We had Edward Deming in Japan. And as a result, uh, the, those countries were able to revive themselves and become uh, independent, prosperous countries. In fact, someone asked Eisenhower after the end of World War II, perhaps humorously, uh, if we won the war, Eisenhower retorted that we don't know. We won't know for 50 years if we won World War II. If at the end of 50 years, uh, the Germans and the Japanese are prosperous democracies, we won. Well, of course they were. Now, move, up, move ahead to the Cold War, the end of the Cold War. Uh, we uh, reverted to the World War I tactics. Uh, not quite as bad, not quite as oppressive, but we humiliated uh, the Russians. 
we said, you're not a superpower anymore. We're the only superpower. We did do uh, uh, some ways of helping them in terms of business dealings, but mostly for our benefit. The business people were involved were somewhat carpetbaggers, and the Russians were left to uh, uh, solve their own problems themselves for the most part. What is the result of this? How about another hard-nosed, hardcore nationalist leader by the name of Vladimir Putin? Now, I'm not saying uh, that he's as bad as Adolf Hitler, but he's very much a nationalist. He's hard-nosed. He's willing to use his military. He's willing to use do things like close down TV stations and, and in a more subtle way, eliminate his enemies. Uh, so this is what we're facing, and we're facing this because, in my opinion, uh, what we did at the end of the Cold War. I had, at that point, uh, 20 years ago, advocated a Marshall Plan for Russia and for the former Soviet countries. Of course, that didn't happen. Uh, now we hear uh, our president talking about what mistakes Putin is, do, is uh, making and how he's digging a hole for himself, etc., etc. It's not the way I see it. I see uh, Mr. Putin as being in the catbird seat, and we are in uh, the ones who are uh, on the outside looking in. He will do what he wants. He has 80% approval in, in his country, as we were told. I, I, I can't personally verify those figures, but I think they're probably accurate. Uh, our president certainly does not have 80% approval. Uh, we don't have a military that could deal with anything except uh, a nuclear war. Nuclear war, we're in good shape. We got lots of nuclear um, missiles. We can destroy them really quickly. But as far as fighting on the ground, we proved uh, over the last few wars that we, we really uh, can't do that, and we have nonetheless reduced our military forces since then. So I think we really need to uh, uh, think through how we're going to deal with Russia. We should have done some things differently 20-plus uh, uh, years ago, but we didn't. Thank you. I want to go for two minutes real quick. To do a quick, I just want to go for two minutes to do a fast evaluation of your speech, and I'll just take two minutes' time if it's not a problem with anybody. Yeah, I'll problem. go right now, and I'll be right quick. Okay, right quick. <laughs> All right, you're going to time me here, Don, yeah, for two I'll, minutes. Yeah, I'll, I'll watch the clock. <laughs> yeah. Okay, how's this, how does this thing work? Okay, I'll hit start. Right, quick now. Okay. First of all, Toastmasters is an organization designed to improve your public speaking. And since he wasn't Toastmasters, I'm going to give him a good Toastmasters evaluation. First of all, your speech was well constructed, had a beginning, middle, end, and had a conclusion, and had a good format and structure to it. However, you're also very aware of the use of the ums and the ahs in Toastmasters. I lost count after <laughs> 20. <laughs> There's a role they call the grammarian in our meetings, and they count the ums, the ahs, the errors, and the filler words. The next part that you needed to do was, with, especially with a heavy speech like this, you needed to have a little more vocal variety, a little more kind of drama to really present the facts and figures. It's a tough thing to bring in that dramatic flair, though, when you're dealing with political speech and especially with political commentary. Overall, good job, good structure, good format. You need a little bit more practice upon delivery, and I think it would do you best to come on back to the organization that teaches you how to speak well in public. Thank you. All right. <laughs> well, Ernie, I liked your speech. Oh, yeah. I, I thought it was really good. I thought that was it was good. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, I want to thank the speaker. Like he said, he welcomed Charles and let him speak, and he glad that we came to see him. Okay. <coughs> you did all right, Dad. Thank you. Uh, now, the, according to the sheets that were passed out, the, what was going to happen today was the myth, the myth of the Cold War. Now, I'm old enough to be here in 45, 55, 65, so forth and so on. Don't need no books. Now, other than some punk and some ignoramus over there, over here, somewhere else, everybody with intelligence that got a big business, got a country, or uh, in any position of power and so forth, 
if they in the same business and they got the same mission, they don't fight one another. That's right. And if you come next week and the guy ain't a right winger, you can get it right out of Orwell's book, 1984. Now, when I was a, 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 a kid, the Russians was coming. The Russians were coming. It scared me to death. I was, the Russians was coming. They had holes in the ground. And they had people digging buckles. And you had a subway in Chicago where you can go down and get away from the Russians. The Russians was coming. The Russians was coming. And they had missiles on the lakefront. Missiles. Because the Russians was coming. Now, guess what? The Soviet Union broke down in 91. In 50, 71, there weren't no missiles out there. In 71, there weren't no bunks where you go down in the ground. The rush was coming and so forth. So guess what? The Russians did something like what the gangsters did. We all have heard about Acapone, Acapone and, 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 and Big Tuna and, and all of those folks with the gangsters and blah, 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 and, 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 and uh, Master Free on Clark Street, we, we all heard about it. We know about those soldiers, right? But guess what? Back in the 60s, <coughs> the big uh, the, the big gangsters used to come from Kansas City, California, Las Vegas, all St. Louis, New Orleans, and they would meet on the East Coast, and they would have this big car. FBI's everywhere, taking license plates, yeah. taking yeah. pictures yeah. and shit back there. And so <laughs> guess what and why they were there? They weren't idiots no more. They in the same business. And they said, listen, fool, the place is big enough for all of us. Right. We ain't got to shoot one another. Well, guess what? That made sense. Uh, anybody with a house of sense would know that. We in the same business, doing the same mission, and got the same enemy. State, it's my goddamn people, millions of people that I got to control. The other state is just like this state. He worried about all them folks he got to control. And those are the people he got to condition. Those are the people he got to brainwash. Those are the people that he got to uh, uh, use when he wants to do something. And that include go to the wall, play like he got the enemy over here, the Russians are coming, and the Russians tell them people that the United States are coming, and all of them, if they come over and knock on one another's door, now, first, if you're a citizen of the United States, right, you go to the White House, knock on the door. I want to see, I want to see a president kid. They say, who the, hey, police, lock your ass up, right? Now, here come <laughs> Kubashaw come over and say, hey, I want to see a uh, uh, president, a uh, 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 candidate. And they say, oh, the president is a Kubashaw. Oh, Mr. Kubashaw, come on in. <laughs> and he go in and they talk, right? But when they leave and the television come on, them goddamn Russians, them goddamn so and so, oh blah blah blah, all of them in the same business. Just like I believe it was Spinoza said, it's the annihilator that set traps for the many and call them states. So the uh, the scariest thing out there for me is a state, a government. <laughs> Governor's proud of you. That's who I'm scared of, the governor. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps the uh, thing that's uh, scarier even than a state is uh, being stateless uh, and not having anybody to go to for what you consider to be justice uh, or know where you stand as to what your rights are. And uh, what's yours and what's somebody else's? That's pretty scary. Uh, and unless you have some way of understanding how you're going to get your next meal, uh, you are up the creek without a paddle. So I would say that it's very important to know what kind of society you have, who you can count on, what you can do and what you cannot do. And there were two major uh, industrial uh, 
giants uh, at the end of uh, World War II. One was the United States, and the other uh, was a much lesser uh, uh, economic power, uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, but it was, since the rest of the world was pretty underdeveloped uh, or flattened by the war, uh, they were it. And they had two different models for industrializing or setting up uh, independent entities uh, of uh, the former colonial powers. Uh, and the world was looking to, even at the end of World War I, uh, Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek, uh, the uh, nationalist leader of China, uh, the big anti-communist, where was he studying? He was studying in Moscow. Yeah. You know, he, he wanted to, but he married a, a son uh, 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 heiress and uh, got involved with the uh, uh, commercial powers that be in, uh, in China and uh, they had the finances uh, to put together uh, the uh, nationalist movement, uh, which was the only, well, they and the communists uh, in, uh, in, in China uh, uh, fought the uh, Japanese uh, and uh, were their big resistance uh, to the Japanese. Uh, in, in the uh, East, <laughs> but in the West, you did have a whole lot of resistance in Middle Europe uh, to uh, the Harkey government in, in uh, hung Hungary, uh, the uh, Romanian uh, Iron Guard, uh, the uh, th these were uh, fascist allies, uh, and, uh, uh, and in uh, Poland, the Home Army and uh, their exported uh, army that had traveled through Russia and uh, Iran uh, <laughs> and gotten uh, uh, across the world to two to uh, Britain and were being armed there by the Americans and British. Uh, though, so you had resistance movements. Uh, it, it, if you were uh, of the bourgeoisie, you didn't want uh, your country to be ruled by the state capitalists. Uh, if you were, a, you know, if you were a private entrepreneur, you had dough and uh, property. Uh, you uh, didn't want the, the uh, uh, Communist Party to take it over. So, but if you were uh, in a minority somewhere, uh, if you were in a, a developing country, Take Palestine. Uh, both the uh, Irgun, uh, the uh, uh, Jewish uh, resistance uh, to the British, and the uh, the uh, Arabs, uh, Arab community, were looking to the Germans uh, to uh, arm them uh, against the British, uh, and uh, they they were looking to overthrow the British rule uh, rather than uh, to uh, side with them. Okay. Uh, that, that's, that's politics. Oh, and you would have to know okay. Okay, where Brown. people stand. We ought to know where people stand. All right. Where do you guys oh, stand? Andy.
Okay. For the next few weeks, I'm going to uh, do a, bring a little piece of something different each week for show and tell. This is uh, an LED light that uses about 3 watts of electricity, and it will replace a 100 watt light bulb behind you. <coughs> You get these in Costco for about uh, $30. This one, uh, you can plug it into a wall, like a cell phone charger, or run it on a portable battery. So, this kind of technology is spreading all over the world. And what we have today is, like Gene said, big corporations, they're not fighting each other in the same business. There's a multi-trillion dollar entity that Harvey Wasserman refers to as King Kong. Coal, oil, nukes, and gas. And King Kong has been spreading out its tentacles all over the world for the last uh, hundred years or so. And um, Smedley Butler, the uh, general in 1935, he wrote a book called War is a Racket. He says, I was muscle for the mob. Uh, the United Fruit Company, Standard Oil. Uh, since World War II, or at least since the end of Korea, the United States military has simply been the largest, best equipped, smoothest, most efficiently run killing machine on the planet. There's no other way to put that. Our soldiers are not fighting for freedom and justice in foreign lands in any way, shape, or form. Speaker. I've there's a book, I, I have, uh, I was a little late tonight because I stopped off the bookstore, they called me, order came in. There's a little book with a bunch of World War II posters in it that have been remastered with comments uh, that are pertinent to Homeland Security today. It's called, You Back the Attack, We'll Bomb Who We Want. And he says, uh, take, give you, there's no copyright, they want you to uh, make big posters out of these copies and uh, spread the word far and wide, make people think, make people wake up. Um, I was verbally attacked here back in 2007 and 2008 Thank you, for friend. bringing Appreciate certain you. kinds of facts in Thank here that uh, people uh, kind of, uh, don't want to face. Uh, Jack, what was it? Who is the general or the, said, uh, you can't handle the truth in a few good was, men? Was Jack I, I call it the Jack Nicholson. I call it the Catholic Church syndrome, where people, a lot of people just won't face the, the idea that the priests have been molesting the kids. That's too bad to think about. Well, uh, America is driven, hundreds of thousands of Americans die needlessly, and millions of people die needlessly around the world because uh, Americans and taxpayers are driven uh, by three major myths promoted by the media. The, the number one myth at the top, it's, uh, it's what I call the trillion dollar golden triangle. I've got uh, these flyers. Anybody wants one, see me after the talk. The number one myth is that our military, 800 bases around the world, trillion dollars a year defending American values. That's a total myth. The second myth is that we were attacked by 19 crazed Muslims on 9-11. It's a total myth, and the evidence is so solid that a seventh grader can understand it. So if you still believe 9-11 was done by 19 crazed Muslims who got lucky, then you gotta love those pedophile priests that are doing a good job with their kids, because you're in the same moral and ethical stance, believing something that has no basis in reality. The third thing, is the military industrial media, you know, the media of pharmaceutical industrial complex that is running our for profit medical system. And the, the third myth on that is, of course, the myth they created in 1984 that a whole bunch of sick people actually were made sick by a harmless virus called HIV. Now, a lot of people died, they died because they were poisoned. Uh, if you don't know any, anything about the Tuskegee experiment, look it up. If you want to see if doctors will do something unethical if you give them enough money. They're, like Gene said, uh, the Russians are coming, the Russians are coming. Well, the HIV epidemic, HIV is coming, HIV is coming, you're at risk. That's been a $400 billion windfall, welfare for billionaires. This golden trillion dollar triangle means that we're running a welfare for billionaires program transferring more wealth faster 
than any time since the pharaohs walked the earth. Um, the United States is at the heart of this. And the first step, we teach seventh graders. In order to solve any problem, you must first correctly identify the problem and then go for the solution. One second. Martin Luther King said best. He said, nothing in the world is more dangerous than sincere stupidity and conscientious ignorance. So uh, if we can just step through the barrier, look at the evidence, it's very easy to understand on a wide range of subjects. Come up, <clears throat> September 13th, we'll be doing an update on 9-11, the forensic evidence, and I'll have literature on these other things that night also. So come next week and uh, see something different. Thank you. Oh, uh, one final, uh, give me 15 seconds. What I meant with this demonstration is a new technology of houses without furnaces, lights that use a tenth as much. It means that we don't have to fight over foreign oil anywhere. Bring the troops home from everywhere and start spending that money in our own country. Yeah. Thank you. Is that understandable? And, what? And you will make profits. Yeah. The greatest <laughs> enemy that you guys rail against is also our greatest friend. It has been a function of the banks. <coughs> and Wall Street, and yes, the corporations that have provided the greatest impetus of economic growth, distribution of wealth, and the greatest growth spur we've had for the last 300 years. The answer to our problems with bringing peace in the world is more trade, more globalization, and of course, more capitalism. Not the crony capitalism we have in a lot of cases, but pure competition no. brought on by the enforcement of property I rights, I don't want any sure? brought on no, by the enforcement of reasonable regulations. I'm not going to sit here and defend a lot of the status quo with a lot of these big companies where they take advantage of their workers. No. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about good old-fashioned competition, good old-fashioned business sense, where you come in, you provide a job, you take a risk, and you get its reward. That's capitalism. You take capital and you build something. You make a corporation, you buy stock and you buy shares in it. And you reap the benefits as an investor. To me, the greatest invention was done in the 1860s, and that was called the revenue bond. It is the impetus that provided the fundamental growth for our economy around the world. And yes, once the corporations got into the growth, they took advantage of the workers. Thank God we had the unions, and the principle of countervailing power prevailed. Now, it's starting to swing the other way a little bit more with the a lot of the big banks and the corporations that we like to rail against. But you also have to remember this. They probably provide the vast majority of capital for startups of new businesses, the bailouts of and restructuring for loans and guarantees of loans. And one of the biggest reasons why Japan and Germany are now prospering very well after World War II is the widespread implementation of capitalistic procedures and property rights. If you don't believe me, believe Fernando de Soto, who wrote a book called The Mystery of Capital. It works. The thing is, it was an assassin's bullet in 1914 sure that <laughs> shut the world down. And it was 90 years later, with the fall of the Berlin Wall, that we finally had okay. the resumption of world trade. The world has chosen capitalism. Yes, we've had a hiccup over the last five years because of the financial crisis, but that was largely because of fraud generated and the relaxing of credit standards, not capitalism itself. And right now, once we get those standards back in place, we're going to see a boom. There are certain things government can do, but I think I've said enough. The growth will continue as long as we can keep our 
heads on the sand, globalization coming, and yes, it can be over with in an instant. I'll get you we do have the bomb, and the close, yeah. history has been dominated by the of Fulham, who have done the impossible, and the button now exists. we got to hold these guys accountable. Thank you. Yeah. All right, now we'll get the other side. Hey, let's get back to what our original topic was. It was. All right, let's thank our speaker. <laughs> All right. All right, when did the Cold War begin? It actually began. I'll give you a couple. You can, I've heard some others here, but when did it begin? I say it began. Right after 1917, I believe it was in 1921, the United States for the first time passed uh, restrictions on immigration. And why did they do this? Not to Lithuanians like you, Charlie. You're darn right. <laughs> they wanted to keep uh, communists out of the United States. So they imposed restrictions on Eastern Europe and those countries to virtually exclude them from entering the United States. The manufacturers were not immune to what was going on, uh, to changes that were taking place, and they didn't want a recurrence in the United States. That, to me, would be, that's, and who declared war is the important thing. Uh, I think it was the capitalists who declared war, since they took to, to protect their own institutions. Um, they were making too much money, quite frankly. Um, and they didn't want any challenges to it. Now another time you could say the Cold War began, and it's going to take me a little bit to get to this, is that the Germans, of course, invaded Russia in the, in, uh, World War II. But they got pretty far, and there was one final battle called the Battle of Kursk. It was Kursk. It was the largest single land battle just about in terms of tanks that has ever taken place in the world in the history of military warfare. And they really, really went after each other uh, to the point where the Russians were just driving their tanks into the German ones even if they didn't have ammunition. It just was a fight to the death. Unfortunately, well, fortunately, depending on who you're looking at it, fortunately, the Germans never recovered from that. And after that, the Russians were on the offensive until the end of the war. So you could say it began there. Uh, and the one reason I say it began there, now this is the point I was getting to, was that when the Russians started moving east, you think they would have been on a direct line to Berlin. West. To, west to capture Berlin. In those days, he captured the capital, killing yeah. the war. No. Stalin went north and south, the armies, and they were capturing land, which became the countries behind the Iron Court. He went up into Finland, they wanted part of that. And they kind of put Germany on hold for a while. The United States actually wasn't going to Berlin. They were going to, they were fearful that Hitler was going to escape to his Bavaria or someplace, so they were going to take southern Germany. So you could actually say in a direct when Hitler when Stalin started going after land, that clearly I think could be taken, construed at least in my mind, as the beginning of the Cold War. Um Let's see. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say, um, I'm sorry, Dave, you gave a little story here. Carmen Stalin knew all about the bomb when he met with Truman. As a matter of fact, they already had plans for a bomb. What they didn't have was the stuff, the plutonium, to make one. They had infiltrated Los Alamos. They knew all about it. And there was nothing, they were not informed in any way. It simply, and that's why the Russians, in, a, in essence, already had the bomb. It simply was a matter of getting around to doing it. 
Uh, let's see. And last of all, I've heard here again some of the old stuff. It works. What? What? Barry is How does in charge. communism works? After the war, they won that war. That country was burned to the ground. They fought the Forest Brothers. They came from nothing. They came from peasantry. That's a system that works. They rose up from the ashes. The United States didn't do anything. They weren't even attacked. There, were, there was no warrior. There was nothing. How can you say it works? They would be a lot better off now on a The system that system. works is what they became. They became, and they were challenging us in the 50s and 60s. Yes, they were. After they came from that war, they won the war. That works. What criteria are you using for that it works? I don't, you know, none. What, this is made up stuff? I'm actually, Charlie, looking at, 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 at what the way at looking at your workers' paradise, like North Korea, like Cuba, and like <laughs> and like uh, some of the other countries oh, that have been under you long term. Want, you, think, you think employment of children is a workers' paradise? There is What's going no on in China and in India, Bangladesh. Don't, don't you? It is still a lot going uh, on. It is in yes, I know exactly what's going on. You have no, that's all right. I welcome it. Okay, one you, at a time. Your data? I'm getting my data straight well, from works. Uh, it works for the capitalists. From, That's from all. One guy out of a thousand. <laughs> Ten thousand. It works. If okay. you like your workers, for everybody else. All right, all right. One pool here. One pool at a time. All right, thanks a lot. <laughs> all right. All right. All right. How many things yeah, works. Okay. Okay. Yeah, works right. with the All right. Okay. <laughs> all right. All right. Who else wishes to give a rebuttal speech? Okay. All right. Uh, nobody? All right. In that case, um, all right. I would like to give a brief rebuttal speech. Uh, now, first of all, first of all, uh, let's have, uh, I'd like to thank Dan Weinberg for coming and speaking here. You know, uh, talking before this crowd. Uh, one can one can hardly say that you are Daniel in the lion's den. You know when you come and speak. Bring All you right. Cake. Now, cake. Now that being said. Let them eat cake. Um, Thank you, sweetheart. Uh, that uh, that being said, the you may I, I would just like to say a few things about the presentation tonight. Um, I thought that um, a lot of the stuff is stuff I knew already. Uh, and you made now what I thought was most interesting. You made some allegations about the U.S. Like, for example, the World War II bombings uh, being meant to send a message. I've heard this sort of thing before. It's not the first time. I've heard it in reference to Hiroshima, for example, that it was meant to send a message to the Russians. Uh, and, and, then the, and, and then the other allegation you made, which is, is in the bulletin, about the, the idea that they agreed that, that each side would do what they want in their own respective spheres of influence. Uh, I don't see the evidence for that. Uh, for either one of those. I mean, I've heard this argument from uh, from from various leftists about how it was meant to that that the bomb was meant the bombs were meant to send a message to Russia. But I I I, I don't see any documentary evidence <coughs> of that. Uh, and and there's uh, and and Dan, you admitted that there there you you this is what you believe was their motivation, but you don't. But this this remains unproven. Now, as for the idea that that the that the Russians, that the U.S. and the USSR agreed to just do what they wanted in their respective spheres of influence. Oh my. I see plenty of evidence that that was not true, more because because there were always let's say, let's suppose that we say that the U.S. and the USSR divvied up the world and they've got spheres of influence, but they kept trying to somebody kept trying to change the borders. For example, North Korea invading communist Soviet back North Korea invading U.S. back South Korea. Okay, or or Soviet back North Vietnam invading U.S. back South Vietnam. Okay, or or uh, U.S. U.S. puppet state Cuba suddenly going communist. Somebody's always trying to change the borders between the two spheres of influence, and most of the time during the Cold War it wasn't us. All right, now. So, so I would, I would not say that the two sides were content. I think the United States, when, when you had something happen like the revolution in Hungary in 1956, the United States was basically powerless to do anything about that. And, 
And so I don't think, I don't believe that the two sides were content merely to let each other um, do what they wanted. I think this was, uh, I think that both sides, I think there's plenty of evidence that both sides saw this as a long war and ultimately a, you know, a, a fight for world domination. Now, now, somebody said during the presentation that the United States is, was the only country that's never had any foreign invaders. Well, I'd have to disagree with that because there was the United Kingdom invading us during the War of 1812. And then there was, um, and, and I would say that, that, that Japan's role in World War II was as, pretty much as an invader of the United States, or at least of some of our territories. And I'm not just, Dave, um, Dave, please be quiet. Uh, I'm not just talking about the bombing of Pearl Harbor, which everybody knows about. But in addition to that, Japan also captured the Philippines, which at the time was U.S. territory. They captured the island of Guam, which was then and still is now a U.S. territory. They, we, they also invaded Alaska, which which was still a territory. Uh, that is the Aleutian the Island. And they captured Wake Island. So that's... Um, so that about the Germans that invaded Long Island? Yeah. Oh, those were just infiltrators. That's not the same thing. It's not total occupation. Those are spies. Uh, Japan. Uh, so this is um, so so the United States. Uh, this was the second invasion of the United States, and, and it was initiated by Japan. Now, the the second now the second thing I now the, the next point I would like to make actually Sid made a very good point that the Cold War did not begin with. Uh, with with the end of World War II, it really began when the when when the Bolsheviks took over Russia and the United States decided, uh, as a matter of policy, to uh, oppose the Bolsheviks and try to overthrow them along with along with the other Western powers, That's what I said. Uh, along with the rest of the World War One allies. Now, I, I wanted to make a point of clarification also about Kurt Vonnegut. Um, during that time, that he actually was in Dresden during World War II. But, but he was not there in his official capacity as a soldier in the U.S. Army. He was there. Uh, he had been captured by the Germans during the during the Battle of the Bulge, and he was um, and he was in Dresden as a POW. Uh, now, the second thing I would I would just like to bring up. Uh, how much time I got left, Tim? Well, about forty-five seconds. Okay. All right. Uh, Dave, uh, you mentioned uh, you know that Russia didn't get Russia would have gotten a piece of Japan uh, if if they had participated more in the war with Japan. Well, it just so happens that Russia actually did, got several pieces of Japan. First of all, uh, they got the Kuril Isle Islands, uh, at, which had been Japanese and are now controlled by Russia, and they also got the southern half of Sakhalin Island, which had also been a Japanese territory and is now a Russian territory. Okay, so. Uh, now those were now those were taken by Japan as part of the spoils of the Russian-Japanese War, which was 1904 to 1905. Uh, uh, but nevertheless, Russia did get Japanese territory, and they still have it. So uh, now, in the case of now, this gentleman over here mentioned MK Ultra Operation Paperclip in Area 51. Okay, and I'd love to explain those to you, but that could take up an entire lecture. And Tim has just informed me that my time is up. All right, so let's let's uh, let's uh, bring up Dan Weinberg to have the final word. Yay! Yeah, we're here. We're here. We all know what's going well, on in Area 51. Mainland China. I mean, yeah. mainland Japan. Yeah. He doesn't know. <laughs> okay. What do you know right. about Area 51? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Okay, you're welcome. Um, thanks everybody for listening, and I learned a lot today. Thanks. Let's give him one more hand.